Okay, so today's class is on real estate financing. Basically, we're going to talk about housing affordability and how that might work for particular buyers, the mortgage terms, the ability to pay, terms and conditions of the promissory note. So that's important to remember. The elements and use of security instruments, mortgages, deeds of trust, real estate financing, judicial foreclosures, and non-judicial foreclosures. Easy for you to say, right? So really, basically, what we're talking about is a little overview and talking about housing affordability in today's world. What does it take to purchase a home, right? What is the investment going to be manageable? How much do you have to finance? Will you get approved, right? So we know that, of course, as real estate agents, as real estate professionals, we should be and usually are promoting home ownership. But we also know that there are times in which you don't necessarily um, want to promote the home ownership if the person has certain issues or has um, circumstances. Like for instance, you know, maybe they're not gonna live long in the area. You know, maybe they only plan on staying in this area for three months or six months or nine months. So does it make sense for them to purchase a home if they're going to stay here for three months and then move to Hawaii or something? Probably doesn't make sense, right? What's their financial situation? You know, just because they might, a bank might have told them they're approved for this amount, maybe financial wise, when you talk with them, their comfort level is here. So you should be having those discussions with people about those particular items. What are their current, what are the current mortgage interest rates? So we know in today's world, mortgage interest rates are awesome. Do you think they get any better than today? I don't know, my friends. I mean, right now there's a, we're from where I'm sitting, which is, you know, in the center of Connecticut, you can go 10, 15 miles either way, get a USDA mortgage, 100% financing, for like 3.25% interest fixed for 30 years, okay, for rural loans. I mean, that's incredible. You know, 3.25%, you can't beat that. What are some of the tax consequences and so forth? So those are the things that, you know, you want to be um, aware of and be able to talk with people about to see what it is that you can do in order to help them, right? We want to make sure that people are not going to have problems. And there's also a thing called predatory lending practices. So what does predatory lending practices mean? When a lender tries to sell, uh, lend you more than you can afford. Could be, right? Or it could be charging too many fees to get a particular loan. Or it could be charging um, a too high of an interest rate. Right. What's the maximum interest rate that a lender can charge you to get a to buy a property? I don't think there's any. There is. Isn't there a cap? There's no cap, my friends. On cars, it is, but not for property. Maybe for cars, maybe for motorcycles, maybe for credit cards, but not for first mortgages. Right. For residential first mortgages. You know what it is? It's like as, as much as your pen will sign for. If you run out of ink, that might be telling you something, right? It's as much as your pen will sign for. So really, there's four basic costs when we refer to pre people buying a property and what they have to pay for monthly. And the acronym for that is P-I-T-I. -I. So what does P-I-T-I -I stand for? Principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. You got it. Principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And I can tell you in today's world, it's really pretty crazy. When I first started real estate, you know, the big portion of the monthly payment was the principal and interest. And then, of course, we had taxes and insurance. Now, in today's world, because interest rates are so low and things have been going, um, you know, so well for particular buyers, is that the major part of it, in some cases, the monthly taxes are higher than the principal and interest payments or about the same. So it's really pretty crazy because there's a lot of people out there that are paying seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 a year for property taxes. 
Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, when I basically got into real estate, it was half that, right? And so um, that's really a big part of it, is understanding that. Another part in determining what a buyer can afford or what they will be qualified for is the wonderful world of the credit score. So, you know, if I haven't told you already, Rob Rosa, he does help people fix their credit the real way. We don't just sign people up and then send them to some internet company that they never get to talk to someone. We actually meet with the people every month and discuss things with them and go over ideas and hold them accountable. That's really the main part is holding that particular consumer accountable saying, hey, why did you go to Bob's Discount Furniture and sign up for another $4,000 of furniture? Why did you go to Macy's and sign up for another credit card? Why did you go to um, Kohl's? Oh, well, they promised me they were going to give me 30% off. Yeah, well, now your credit score just went down 27 points and you're no longer approved to buy a house. Do you think those things happen? Sure. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm in the middle of a real estate transaction. And believe me, most of the time I tell the buyer this in the beginning and or the mortgage person will tell them in the beginning. Okay, at least until we get to the closing table, do not charge anything. Do not open up, open up any new credit cards. Do not close any new credit cards. Well, probably in my career, it's like every three, four years, we get this close to the closing table and what happens? People They're don't- no longer qualified, their credit is dropped. Yeah. We had this one lady, it was the day after, it was the Tuesday after Labor Day weekend or went maybe Wednesday. Um, the bank reruns your information right at the last minute in many cases, right? And so here we were, I think it was the Wednesday after Labor Day weekend at 10 a.m. We we're supposed to have the closing. The um, paralegal comes into the um, closing and, and talks, whispers to the, uh, to the attorney. And the attorney's like, hold on a second. I'm sorry, I have to stop the closing. He leaves, walks out for like 10, 15 minutes, comes back, tells me and the buyer, I'm sorry, um, I could, we can no longer finish the paperwork for the closing. And she was like, well, why, what, what's going on? And he said, well, your lender just called me and I guess your credit score went down and your debt to income ratios are off and you're no longer approved for the mortgage. And she's like, what are you talking about? And so now we had to call the lender to try to find out what happened. And she didn't tell anybody. She was trying to take advantage of a scenario where you have the Labor Day furniture sale. And she spent like $7,000 on furniture for her brand new house that she can no longer buy. That's a true story. Right. Or Rob, how about the scenario? So a good friend of mine, she was in the process of buying a house and she got her money from her 401k to buy the house. Anyway, she dipped into that money and instead of having $10,000, she now have $9,000. So when she went back to the mortgage company, they're like, wait a minute, you cannot spend your money. So what she had to do was get money from me to put it in there. I had to give it, I think it was called like a, a, a gift. Yeah. So I had to give her a gift to make up back that money to buy her house. Yeah. So those kinds of things happen once in a while, right? But you have to be very careful. Once you get the ball rolling, don't make mistakes. So anyways, we help people get through this and we talk about it. And like I said, it's coaching and holding accountable. So my question to you is what's the highest credit score you can have? 830, I think it is. 850. 850. Yeah. All right. So just remember this. It is 850, right? So when you're at um, the 4th of July, well, we don't know now because of the wonderful COVID, which I hate to even bring it up. But if you are go to a 4th of July picnic or a Labor Day picnic, and because this has happened to me and you start talking to people like how you're getting into real estate and you're all excited about things and you're, they're like, somebody says to you, well, I want to buy a house. And you're like, yeah, definitely. I'll help you. And just for the heck of it, you say, so how's your credit? Pretty good. And they're like, oh, you kidding me, man? My credit's awesome. I'm like at 875. And you're like, <laughs> you are? And they're like, oh yeah, I check it all the time. I'm, I think 
you know, just last week I was like at 890, but I was using my credit card. I actually had somebody tell me that, tell me that. Oh yeah, just last week I was like at an 890 and um, I think my score was down to 875 because you know, I use Credit Karma and they pretty much tell me everything. So that's the person. Do you think I call them out on it? No, I don't call them out because you know what? If they want to lie right to my face like that, I'm just like, okay. Now I know who I'm talking with, right? Now I know what the story is with this person, right? But people will lie to you. So remember, the range is 300 to 850. 850 is the highest credit score you can get. And those are, um, you know, basically scores that are developed um, from, they say, the Fair Isaac and Company. And there's, there's actually three different credit bureaus that report your scores. Who knows what the three credit bureaus are? Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. I think. Oh man, you are kicking some butt today. You got it, right? Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. So those are the three um, credit bureaus that we use, right? And was that you, okay. go ahead, I'm sorry, did someone have a question? Sorry, what's the lowest score you can have for a home buy to be a homeowner? Well, that's a good question. There is none actually. Can you get a Can you get a mortgage with a 550 credit score? Perhaps you let the bank tell you no. Yeah. That's true. You don't know. You don't know what banks are doing what. You don't know what brokers can come up with things. Some brokers come up with in-house financing. If you have, um, you might have a million dollars in the bank, but a, a 400 credit score, they might give you a loan. Who knows, right? It just depends on so many different things. And so we hate to make that assumption. You know, there are requirements, which we're going to talk about more in this unit and the next, if it's an FHA loan, and so that the primary uh, mortgage market can sell it to the secondary mortgage market. And maybe they're looking, you might be talking about, well, they're looking for at least a 620 or a 640. But I mean, as an example, I have someone who emailed me yesterday, a lender saying that he can give loans out for 580. It just totally depends on a lot of different things. Make sense? Yep. All right. Now, lenders are also going to look at a loan applicant's debt to income ratio. So, what is debt to income ratio all about? How much your bills total versus how much you take in. That's right. Right. So, basically, how does your gross income compare with how much ink, um, how much debt you have, right? So, you know, they want to make sure that it's understood that your monthly payments on all debts, and when we say debts, we're usually talking about long-term debts, right? We're usually talking about things like car payments, student loans, mortgages, maybe even, of course, other credit cards. These are things that are where? That are what? Usually they where? Where, where would you see these items? On your credit report. On your credit report, right? So they're not things like your cell phone bill, unless maybe you didn't pay your cell phone bill and now that shows up on your credit report as a negative, right? They're not things um, such as your gas bill, unless you owe CNG or Eversource, you know, four grand for not paying your gas bill. They're not everyday um, expense, living expenses, right? And so basically what's expected, you know, to, in order to get the best rates is that your um, monthly PIT payments, PITI payments, right? Mm -hmm. Are not going to be more than 28% of your monthly income. So that's the first ratio to look at saying, okay, well, my monthly income, as an example, is $5,000 gross, right? So let's say you bring home um, $2,250 a week. I mean, oh, my goodness. Um, my number is $1,250 a week, right? Before taxes, pre-tax. So you bring home $1,250 per week which equals $5,000 a month. And they take 28% of that and say, okay, 
the maximum housing expense allowed for principal, interest, taxes, and insurance is $1,400. So does that make sense to everyone? Now, are there loans that use different ratios? Yes, there's a lot of different loans that use different ratios. But the 28% the number that we just spoke about is used if you want to get the best terms possible. And then the second number that they might look at is the 36%, right? And the 36% is all about, okay, that's going to equate to what your total housing will be plus other debt expenses. So again, here you are, $5,000 gross every month. Again, maybe $1,250 a week you actually make, okay, you actually make before taxes. You take that number times 36% and that gives you $1,800 for total housing and other debt expenses. That's the most it can be if you want to get the best terms possible. Are you including uh, taxes, house taxes in that or no? Nope. Okay. Nope. So remember, and that's where you think about it. Think about you have a pie and that's a hundred percent. Well, they're saying, okay, you can afford, or you should be able to afford 36% for your housing and other long-term debts. So what does that leave you? 64%, right? Mm -hmm. 100% minus 36% gives you 64%. And that 64% is supposed to be sufficient for you to pay your taxes, which in many cases, for many people, that's like around 20, 30%. And then to also be able to pay your utilities and your food and your fun and those different types of expenses. But most, a lot of those mortgages have um, the taxes rolled in to the uh, mortgage, right? House taxes. Oh, so you're talking about real estate taxes? Yes. That's yes. What, if the yes. 1800 included the real estate taxes. Yes. Yep. The PITI, those four things, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Yes. I thought you were talking about income taxes. But yeah, so remember that 1800 should include PITI, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Who else has questions on that sort of thing? Okay, so that's why you want to keep your debt as low as possible, because that's going to make things easier for you to be eligible for better mortgage programs. Right now, a lender might also consider a loan to value ratio. So what's loan to value ratio? Who knows? The amount of your loan versus the amount of the property, the property value. Right. Or, or the purchase price of the property. Right, the amount of the loan as a percentage of the purchase price. So, you know, again, if the loan to value is 90%, right, loan to value is 90%, how much is your down payment? Ten percent. Ten percent. If the loan to value is 80%, how much is your down payment? Twenty. Right? Does everybody get that? And you see, so the high I don't get that. I don't get that. If we if we were first talking about the twenty five percent, how does it change? Well, we were talking about loan to value, right? Okay. So, so loan to value is what's the percentage of the loan compared to the purchase price? So right. the higher the loan to value, right, the more riskier it is for a bank. So if you're going to put down, let's say you're going to do a 25% down payment, right? What's the loan to value? You're going 75%. To put, yep, so you got 100%. You're going to put down 25%. So the loan to value is 75%. Does that make sense? Who's got questions on that? If you're going to put down 10%, what's the loan to value? 90%. I can do the math part. I'm just trying to figure out the, the yep. logic. Yep. So the higher the loan to value, the riskier you are for the bank. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, Sharon, are you asking about the 25% from before? We were, yeah. The commercial real estate? Yes, I, I was. That was only for commercial. Here. Yeah, I was stuck. I got it. Yeah. I don't have a mortgage. I never had one. So I'm curious how that all that works. So you're educating me. <laughs> that's the way to do it. Hey, if you can pay in cash, that's the way to do it. Yeah, luxury. Yep. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, you know, again, usually we were talking about earlier in class, if you're going to put, if you're going to buy a commercial property, usually you have to put down at the minimum 25%. Right. right? And so your loan to value for that would be 75%. Yep. I got it. Make sense, everyone? Yep. Yeah. All right. Here we go to the next wonderful world of borrowing, right? So remember, there's two parts to basically this whole thing about a mortgage, okay? And the first part is called the promissory note. That is the borrower's personal promise to repay the debt, okay? Um, and the person who um, executes it or the person who signs the document, which you as the buyer would be signing the document, right? You're called the maker or the payor. And then the lender is called the what? What's the lender called when we talk about a promissory note? The payee. the payee right the payee and that promissory note is usually going to like state the amount of the debt the time and method of the payment the rate of interest and all that kind of good stuff right and what are the terms of the note now the note is considered to be a negotiable instrument right so what does that mean if something is negotiable a negotiable instrument what does that mean Well, two parties, two two parties to go at each other for, um, and it's worth money. It has an value. offer, or counter offer. Yeah, they go back and forth, or negotiate. Right. I guess this is not rocket science. They they fight for the price. <laughs> okay, so we're not talking about the buyer and the lender negotiating. It has value that it's got. There's it's 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 um. It's like money, basically. It's something that you can use for the purchase. Right. Okay. It's like tender. Kind of, right? So here's the story. The payee, which the lender is the lender, right? Do you think that they want to have you sign this mortgage that you're going to pay them off in 30 years and then just wait there for 30 years to get all the money back? What do they want to do? They want to get paid right? as ASAP and they right. want to try to get more money to make money off of that money to make money off of that money. Right. Right. So the so whole point is, first, right. You pay off a lump of the interest first. That's why. Well, you, that's called amortization, which we're going to talk about. The whole point that I want to get is that it's a negotiable instrument where the payee or the lender, they retain the right to sell it. They retain the right to transfer, um, to sell it or receive payment to a third party by assigning it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So what that really means, and think about it this way, in real life, usually when you um, go to buy a home and you're, get, you're giving a mortgage in order to get the property, you're using signing documentation that you understand that maybe over 75 or 80 or 85% of the time, what's the bank going to do? Sell the mortgage. And then in three months, six months, nine months, who knows how long, you're no longer gonna be paying ABC lenders, you're gonna be paying one, two, three lenders. Does that make sense to everyone? See, so that's the whole point is because there's certain companies that they just want to sign up the loans, get the loans together, and then they sell them, sell them so that they can then get more loans and they can make money off of money. And then there's other companies that they become like more of the service companies and they might want to buy particular loans to be able to service them in different ways, right? So that's the whole point. That's why they say it's negotiable. 
It's a negotiable instrument. The payee who holds the note may transfer the right to receive payment to a third party. Make sense? Yes. All right. What is interest? Sounds pretty simple, right? But what is it? What's interest? Charge for the use of money. That's right. So every day that goes by, you are paying interest for having that money. That's why it's better if you pay it off quickly. Debt acceleration. The quicker you pay things off, the less money you pay in interest. Just because you, you signed up for a 30-year mortgage doesn't mean you have to wait 30 years to pay it off. And almost all the residential mortgages I know in 2020, in today's world, I don't know of any right now that have prepayment penalties. Back when I started real estate, there were some mortgages that had prepayment penalties, but right now I don't know of any, okay? So you wanna try to pay as quick as possible. Make sense, okay? In order to save that money. Or, you know, some people might tell you, well, it's good for, um, tax deductions. Some people might tell you, well, you know, you're borrowing this money at three and a half percent and, you know, you can take your other money and go make seven percent with it. And then you make the, you're making, you know, another whatever difference and it's better for you. So it just depends on your comfort level, how debt free you really want to be, what you feel comfortable with. You can get three, four, five different financial analysts together, and they're all going to give you different stories about what they feel is the best way. And then plus a lot of it has to do with your comfort level. I just feel like uh, my particular opinion is the more debt free you are, the better of a life that you can have and you don't have to worry so much about the future because you never really know what's going to happen, right? So most of the time when we talk about interest and a mortgage, we're talking about interest that get, gets paid in arrears. So if I tell you that interest are, is paid in arrears, what does that mean? You pay the interest up front on the loan as opposed to uh, in incremental amounts. Okay, so let's think of it this way. If you're paying rent, you're paying rent. So July 1st, you're renting an apartment right now. July 1st, your rent is due for when? I don't know. For what month? July. July, right? So are you paying that rent in advance or in arrears? Arrears? Advance. Advance. In advance, because technically, now you might be like, well, I have until the 10th to pay my rent because that's what the state gives me. Okay. I know some people that that's what they're going to say. I have until the 10th to pay the rent because that's what the rent the state gives me. But technically, the rent is due on the first for that particular month, right? So we, when you pay that rent on July 1st, that's in advance for the rest of July. Does that make sense? And then August 1st, so it's in advance for August, okay? Now, let's talk about buying a house. Here it is, today is July what? 29th, how many days, I mean June. How many days do we have in June, 30? 30. Okay. So we really only have one more day in the month. If you bought a house today, right, when is your next or first mortgage payment? August. The, uh, August. July 1st? Yeah. August. It would, be, it would be in August. Okay. And so let's talk about that. When you make that payment in August, right, what are you paying for August 1st? You're paying from June 30th and all of July. Well, technically you're paying for the month of July. Okay, yeah. Right? Technically you're paying for the month of July because you used up all that, every day that went by, there was more interest that was calculated. And then when you make that payment in August, that's making a payment, what? In arrears. See, because you used up all the, you used up all the days and now you make the payment. That's in arrears. 
You use up all the days and then you make the payment. Make sense? Yes. Except we're at the closing table. So today is June 29th. If you made, if you had a bought a house today, you'd pay, let's say two days worth of interest, right? Because you paid to the end of the month and that's in advance. So when you first buy a house, the closing costs and so forth, go to the end of the month and that's in advance. Then you get that whole month for free and then you have to make a payment in arrears. So did that confuse you at all? Does anybody have any questions on that? It's confusing. Is it always like that? 90 something percent of the time. Okay. Yeah, almost all. So if you buy a house July 15th. Okay. Right, you buy a house July 15th. Right. How many days are in July? 31? 31. So you're going to pay 16 days on July 15th. You're going to pay 16 days of interest to go to the end of the month on July 15th. You're going to pay 16 days. And so you're basically making that interest payment in what? In advance. Yeah. Right? Yep. Now, August 1st comes, you go through the whole month of August. You don't, you don't pay anything. Then September 1st comes along, you make your first payment. And so now you're paying when? In arrears. In arrears, yeah. From then on, it's always in arrears. Okay. So who's got questions on that? A little bit tricky, right? But you kind of got to get used to it and understand it, right? Um, on how payments are made. And sometimes it gets tricky. And sometimes, you know, we, we're at the closing table, we have a loan officer there and they're like, and I'll tell you, you know, what else we did for is you don't have to make a payment until, uh, until August. Not really a favor. Yeah, not really a favor. <laughs> it's basically just the way that it works. <laughs> you know, but hey, some people they are gonna take credit for every little thing they can, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Usury, we talked a little bit about it earlier. What is usury? Overcharging interest or uh, uh, setting an interest rate higher than the person qualifies for. You were, you were like 80% there, Sharon, you're doing pretty good. Charging interest in excess of the maximum rate allowed by law. So again, there I'm sure there are, you're gonna have to ask, um, your attorney general, right? I used to always think of Blumenthal, but I don't think he's, he's now a senator for us, right? But you're gonna have to ask your state attorney general what's the maximum allowable interest rate for credit cards. I'm sure there is one. I'm pretty sure there is one, whether it's 29% or 36% or whatever it is. I'm sure there's one for cars, personal property, but for um, in Connecticut for first time, for, for real estate, residential mortgages, there isn't one. Is that only for first time? Well, or I don't I should say first time, I should say for first mortgages. Okay. For first mortgages, residential properties. Okay. There's no usury rate. All right. Um, loan origination fee. So what's a loan origination fee? the processing of a mortgage application. Right, so I mean, think about it this way. Um, you know, the loan officer, the processor, the underwriters and all that good stuff, they all need to get paid as well, right? So in most cases, there is a loan origination fee and it's usually one point. So when I say one point or one, what does that mean, one point? When I say, oh yeah, that's one point. What is one, that? One percentage point of the total amount borrowed. That's right. One per, up one percent of the mortgage, right? So if the mortgage is one hundred and ninety thousand dollars, and the loan origination fee is one point, how much would it be? One thousand nine hundred. That's right. All right. If the mortgage is um, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and the loan origination fee is one point, how much would it be? Thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred. So does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so that's the wonderful world about loan points. Now, how about discount points? What are discount points? 
that's extra fund, right, to reduce the interest rate. Right, it could be basically used to increase the lender's yield or rate of return on investment, right? Might be to make up the difference in order to give them a lower interest rate. Okay, so it's the difference between the number of charge um, points charge is going to be the difference between the loan's interest rate and the yield required by the lender. So this lender might come to you and say, hey, I can give you this mortgage for 4%. Right, because they need to make some money, their investors need to make some money, and that's what they're able to give you. And you're like, well, I really, you know, wanted to get a mortgage for three and a half percent, which is a half percent lower than four percent. They might say, okay, they're going to look up on their chart or really they're probably going to input it into their computer and they're going to figure out, okay, in order to give you an interest rate of three and a half percent, they're going to charge you one point. Right, because they need to still make up the difference of what they need to pay either themselves or the or the investors. Does that make sense? So who's got questions on that? Any questions on discount points or what a point equals or loan origination fees? Okay, I made a comment earlier about prepayment penalties. What, is it, what does that mean, prepayment penalties? Or prepayment penalty clause? If you paid off your loan early, uh, you got charged for it. Right, so usually in today's world, I mean, it's been quite a few years. Um, I haven't seen any residential mortgages that have that kind of issue. But of course you should always double check, but I highly doubt you know we're gonna be seeing it that anytime soon necessarily, a prepayment penalty. Um, so you get the opportunity to pay off your loan as quick as you want to, which is pretty huge, right? Okay. Um, we also have the term in here, hypothecation. So who knows what's hypothecation? Well, I just read it. It says when you have to put down collateral for a loan. Okay. So really, if you think about it, right, when it comes to mortgage lending, right, the debtor, right, the, um, the person who's buying the property, right, the debtor, we retain um, the right of repossession. You know, the property is going to be put in your name and um, can, you can have the opportunity to, to control the property. However, there needs to be something where this particular organization, meaning the creditor, whether it's Wells Fargo or Chase Bank or whoever it is, right? They have what's called an equitable right into the property, right? They have the right to be able to foreclose on the property if um, the, the borrower defaults according to the security, um, to the agreement, right? Um, they have the right to be able to say, hey, listen, you didn't make your payments. The, the property was used as collateral. And so now we're gonna take the property back. And that's one form of the word hypothecation according to your yellow book. So, so does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Just for contrast, um, well, is there a term for the opposite of that? Like, like before we talked about like private financing, like private financing is kind of like the guy that still had his name on the deed, right? But he did a private finance to the buyer and then. Yeah, so that's a land contract or owner financing. Yeah, yeah, so that's the opposite of hypothecation, just for, or is it, you get where I'm going with it a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, because, I understand what you're saying because remember, most of the time, the deed is being put in the borrower's name, but it might be considered the opposite because in the land contract, the deed isn't pertinent into the owner, into the debtor's name until it's totally paid off. So, I mean, you could think about it like that a little bit. Yeah, just just throwing it out there. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So. 
Remember, in Connecticut, you probably always, you most of you have probably heard about the term mortgage, right? In Connecticut, we um, the borrower receives a loan, right? They receive the money in return for um, giving a promise, a promissory note or a mortgage to the lender. So you see, you as the borrower, you have to reprogram your mind. Um, you have the power. Do you have to give the lender a mortgage? No, you can save up your money and buy a house in cash. You're not gonna be the first one to do that. I mean, last January, I had somebody um, who bought a $400,000 condo in Glastonbury cash. You can do it if you want to, right? But if you decide that you want to give, you're giving the lender a promise. You're giving them a promise in return for the money. So that's what I wanted to go over because these next two pages in your book, they can get a little bit tricky if you're not following along what I'm saying. So there's a little picture there on figure 12.1 that shows a mortgage. And that's what we usually do in Connecticut because of the way that our, I've been told, because of the way our foreclosure laws work, it's just much simpler for us to do mortgages. So how does a mortgage work? How many parties are there in a mortgage? Two, right? There's the mortgagor. So who's the mortgagor? The buyer. That's right. The buyer or the borrower. And you see, they are giving, if you look at the arrow, they're giving the note, which is also the promise, the promissory note in the security instrument, the mortgage, to the lender, the mortgagee. So remember, you, you don't go to the bank to get a mortgage. You go to the bank to get money so that you can buy a property. You, you give them the mortgage. You give them your promise. Does that make sense? I yeah. know. Yes, you're giving them business, basically. Or That's right. Mm -hmm. And you're giving, the biggest thing to remember is you're giving them your promise. And it, it just, to, to, not, to not get too sidetracked, I'll just be very straightforward with you. It amazes me, especially when it happened after 2007 and eight. Now we know during the last mortgage crisis, there were people that passed away. And so then other people couldn't afford the house. Understandable, there were people that got divorced and they bought the house based upon two incomes. Understandable. There were people that lost their jobs and then they couldn't pay their mortgage. Understandable. But I know more than one person who said to me, well, I'm not paying my mortgage because my house isn't worth as much as it used to be. I can't go too much further back, otherwise I'm gonna fall over, <laughs> right? And I just looked at them. I'm not gonna debate with people. I don't. I don't have time to persuade people, all right? I don't debate like that. If you wanna pay me to start debating and be a politician, then I'll do it, right? So I just say, okay. But I, I walk away saying to myself, okay, so now I know that person's character because they made a promise to the bank and they didn't say, oh, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to buy this house, I'm going to take this money from you, but if the house isn't worth as much as it was, I'm not going to pay you. That's not right. That's not being a good character, right? Because remember, you're making a promise to repay the debt, and you should be doing everything you can to repay the debt. Those other scenarios, I, you know, of course, I got to have some compassion. I understand. But when somebody makes a statement, well, I'm not paying that, I'm not paying that because it's not worth as much as I used to. Well, that's not what you agreed to with the bank. And that's why we had so many problems of people doing that sort of thing. All right. So that's my little side track. I got on my soapbox a little bit. Sorry about that. Right. But anyways, you see, when the money is borrowed, the mortgager or borrower gives the note to the lender in return for the loan or the money. When the money is repaid, what do you get from the mortgage or lender? Mortgagee or lender, what do you get? A deed. A deed. And what else? What document do you want to make sure that you get? 
call it the satisfaction of mortgage. That's right. You want to make sure you get that satisfaction of mortgage. It happened to me again like three weeks ago. What did I do? And I put it in an email. I First of all, I told the, the seller like two times. I put it in a text, made sure I was covered. And then I put it in an email. And what did I tell them like four times, five times before the closing date? And I'm talking like a month before the closing. Hey, make sure you talk with the attorney and make sure you talk with the lender to get your um, satisfaction of mortgage document showing that you paid off the mortgage. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, we'll, we'll take care of that after. No, do, you should do it now because um, do you think when you call Bank of America and you tell them, hey, I'm having a closing on my house July 5th, um, can you send me the satisfaction of mortgage? What are they going to tell you? They need two weeks, three weeks, five weeks. <laughs> say, okay, we'll send it over to you. You know, usually it could take anywhere from five to 21 days. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you put a rush on that for me? Because we're really supposed to have our closing July 5th. Oh, well, we'll see what we could do. It takes anywhere from, from five to 21 days. They don't care. Right? And we, then the seller was a little bit mad because we were two, three days late in the closing. They didn't have the documents. But I was waiting for them to say something because I already had my, I went back and I'm like, I know I texted them on this. I emailed on this and I even emailed their, their um, lawyer. So it wasn't on me, right? Because remember, I'm just the coach. I'm the baseball team manager. For those of you who hate sports, I apologize. But think about a baseball team manager or a store manager, right? If you like retail. Um, the, the baseball team manager doesn't go out there and play first base, right? But he might talk to the first base about what needs to be done and how to do it. The store manager is really not supposed to start up a cash register and start ringing people out. They're supposed to be running the store, right? So if you want to be a good real estate agent, a lot of times that's what you have to be. You have to be managing things, getting all the different parts together, making sure the seller's doing this, the lawyer's doing that, the, mor the mortgage lender's doing this, the other agent's doing that, getting the documents together, coordinating things. And the more you do that, the more successful I think you would be in the long run. All right. So we talked about a mortgage. Who has questions about mortgages? All right. Well, the next page is what's probably going to confuse you if this is the first time that you're ever seeing this, and that is called a deed of trust. The wonderful world of the deed of trust. Now, is it against the law that we do not do deeds of trust in Connecticut? No, it's just that some states, right, they prefer that, um, or lenders will prefer to use this three-party security instrument known as a deed of trust because of the way that things work with foreclosure laws. So I've never even seen one done in real life because again, we don't really do these in Connecticut, but they could if they really wanted to. Um, it's just the whole point of how it works. So here's how it works. In a deed of trust, how many parties are there? Three, right? And so we have the trustor, which is the borrower, right? And you see the trustor gives two things. They give the note or the promise, right? The promissory note to the beneficiary or, or lender in return for the money. And then they give a deed of trust to the trustee. Now, who's got an idea of who the trustee is? The third party. Right, and, and usually who? So what I've been told, right, is the trustee, it can't be the same company as the lender, right? But, okay, but it's probably like, okay, the lender's on the first floor and the second floor, and then in the back corner office, you have this attorney who's a separate business than the lender, but they're the trustee, and they pretty much get all their business from that bank, mm -hmm. right? that would be the trustee. And so they get the deed of trust. Then when the loan is finally 100% paid off, the trustee gives a release deed or deed of reconveyance. So who's got questions on that? Anybody have any questions on that? You said that's illegal in Connecticut? No. 
I just said that it's not really used in Connecticut. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, that's okay. So remember, it's just not used in Connecticut because I've been told that it really doesn't make sense when it correlates to our um, foreclosure laws. Because in Connecticut, this gets a little bit, um, I don't know the exact details of every little bit of this, but you know, in Connecticut, we're a strict foreclosure state, which we have laws that are a little bit different than a lot of other states um, for foreclosures. All right, so any questions on that, on the difference between a mortgage and a deed of trust? All right, let's keep on moving forward. Duties of the borrower. So remember, you as the borrower are a mortgagor. Okay, so what are your duties? Usually payment of the debt in accordance with the terms of the promissory note. Payment of all real estate taxes on the property, right? Maintenance of adequate insurance to protect the lender. So let's say you don't pay your insurance, your homeowner's insurance, for some reason or another, it's not paid. What's the lender going to do? Pay it themselves, PMI. Well, we're not talking about PMI because that's private mortgage insurance. We're talking about homeowner's insurance, right? Okay. If you don't pay your homeowner's insurance, the lender is going to be happy enough to say, okay, we're going to go get homeowner's insurance for you. Right. Now, in the regular world, you might be paying $900 a year for this homeowner's insurance. Do you think the lender is going to get you insurance and that's only $900 a year? No. No, they're going to get you insurance that's like $1,700 a year. Mm -hmm. and make money off of you for that. So you got to be careful of that. What else does the borrower need to do? Maintenance of the property in good repair of all time, at all times. So I've never seen a, a mortgage rep or lender rep come to a property to make sure it's in good repair, except a couple of times for commercial property. For commercial property, I have actually seen a lender do like a um, audit or a walkthrough of a property. So that's kind of interesting. And then the last one I think is kind of funny only because I never seen it happen. Receipt of lender authorization before making any major alterations on the property. Like, have you ever seen anybody say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm putting an addition on my house and just got to call Chase Bank and get their permission. Yeah, I'm redoing this on my house. I just got to call Wells Fargo and get their permission. Never really see that happen. But remember, that's what you're supposed to do. Now, there's gonna be quite a few different clauses we have to remember in this unit when it comes to mortgages. So the first one's called acceleration clause. What is that? What's acceleration clause? Um, it moves the foreclosure faster. It could move the foreclosure faster. But it's basically the right that if they believe you're in default, they can declare the entire amount due and payable immediately to start the foreclosure. So what's the laws or the rules and when a bank or a lender can start a foreclosure? How long? Anybody got any idea? 60 days. You like 60? Anybody else? Three to four months. Three to four months. Anyone else? 120 days. All right. So here's the story. There is no rule. Here's what I've seen. I've seen foreclosures start after 60 days of not paying. And I've seen people or lenders wait three years before they start the foreclosure process. I've seen people who we're able to go three years without having to pay a mortgage. And then I go and talk to them and I say, hey, um, hey, I know, understand you've been through hard times, you haven't paid your mortgage. Um, so I, you know, I'll help you sell this property. What do you wanna do? Like, where do you plan on moving? Do you have money saved up for a security deposit? And um, you know, to rent or whatever it might be. And they got the, the Lexus in the driveway and the 65 inch TV um, with two adult males sitting there playing games but they get that they don't have any money saved up for deposit for rent. Crazy. 
wake it up, wake it up, right? Here's the story though, it gets a little crazy. I've seen people where they got behind on their mortgage three, four, five months, right? Now they might owe 10 grand, okay? And maybe they're able to come up with seven of that 10 grand. And so they figure, oh, let me send this over to the lender so I can get things caught up. What does the lender usually do? They take it and apply it toward the balance due, but they uh, continue with the foreclosure. Wouldn't, no, that they sound, send it. wouldn't that sound logical? Oh, no. They, they, yeah, they don't accept the money. They don't accept they, it. Now, there, before we, you know, in this class, Mom, this is learn, my slipping stick. right? In this class, we have to learn there's always exceptions, but the vast majority of the time, they don't take the money. They want the entire amount that you owe that you're in default. Otherwise, they'll send it back to you and continue with the eviction, I mean, the foreclosure process. Because you see, if they take that money, it will cloud the issue about what's really owed and um, does it stop the foreclosure? Does it delay the foreclosure and so forth? So I've seen people where they've gotten six, seven, eight thousand dollar checks sent back to them from Wells Fargo because they owe 12 grand and Wells Fargo is not going to accept a partial payment. Yeah. So most of the time they won't take a partial payment. Right. So things will get really quite crazy. So remember, all we're talking about in this, this discussion is that when you're signing those 40 pages to buy a particular home, that in there somewhere, there's usually an acceleration clause that says that if you go into default, the lender can declare the entire principal due and payable immediately. Make sense? All right, what's assignment of a mortgage? We kind of talked about it a little bit already. What is it? The negotiable instrument, uh, a promissory note. That's right. So remember, the original mortgagee, which is now the assignor or the original lender, can endorse it and give it to another party in order for that new party to become the new owner of the debt and the security instrument. And that happens a lot, a lot, a lot. And it's really not a big deal. You know, that's how they make their money. They don't want to sit and wait 30 days, I mean, 30 years in order for you to pay them. So they sell it to other parties, right? There is a, another clause called the defeasance clause. So again, in those 40 pages of all the documents that you sign when you're buying a property, one of the clauses is probably going to be a defeasance clause. So what's a defeasance clause? public record that shows that the lender is divested from the property. Right. And also that the lender is required. What's it basically going to say is they're required to execute a satisfaction of mortgage or a release or discharge when the note has been fully paid. So, you know, it's almost kind of like, I don't know exactly if it's on the federal law books types of things, but I believe there is something in place that says, Hey, you know, the lender understands that when you are paid, when you pay them in full, they have, they, through the defeasance clause, they have to send you a release or discharge or document called the satisfaction mortgage. But of course, a lot of times they'll make mistakes or they'll forget to do it. And that's when you have to follow up with them. Make sense? Yes. All right. Reserves, tax and insurance reserves. Right. So many lenders are going to require that borrowers provide a reserve fund to meet future real estate taxes and property insurance premiums. So what's kind of interesting is a lot of times people, they'll buy a home and, you know, we said, again, it's a 30 year fixed um, rate. But remember, the only two things that are fixed is the principal and the interest. The taxes and insurance are not fixed those are going to probably go up almost every year, right? I mean, definitely I, I, I see taxes go up at least a little bit. Once in a while, they'll stay the same, but most of the time they're always going up just a little bit. And insurance, I don't really don't see going down either. 
But the whole point is, is that there usually is a fund or an impound or escrow account that's set up by the lender for you to be lucky enough to put money in so that they can pay the taxes and the insurance for you. Make sense? And, you know, in today's world, there's going to be a limitation as to what is the maximum they can ask you to put in there. You know, things got a little bit crazy um, back around 2007 when we had the mortgage crisis 2008, where um, all of a sudden, instead of wanting, let's say, two months or four months, whatever it might be, they wanted six, eight, 10 months. And so people had to come up with a lot more money in order to buy a property and they weren't able to do that. Right. Does that make sense? So there are some limitations about, you know, what's the amount that they can require in order for giving you a mortgage. Make sense? There's even one um, escrow fund for flood insurance. So if you're one of those lucky enough people that you have to pay flood insurance, right? Um, the borrower might say, hey, we got to put together an escrow account and you're going to have to um, put the cost of the insurance in there and so forth. And, you know, there's a lot of different information concerning flood insurance. Um, assumption of a mortgage or by or, or subject to the mortgage. So what does that mean? When a property is sold subject to the mortgage. Do, 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 do. What's subject to? Kind of like a term you depending upon or it's uh, to be determined, I guess, or. It sounds like a pretty good, pretty good guess, right? The word subject to. I mean, or, the term subject to, yes. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about subject to, we're basically saying that the borrower or the a buyer can take the property by basically um, taking title to the real estate and making payments on the existing loan, okay? So this is one of those things where like they don't go and get their own loan. This is one of those things in the vast majority of cases you really can't do in real life um, or you're not supposed to, especially when it comes to residential property. Every now and then you might find a certain circumstances with circumstance where a commercial mortgage, you might be able to take um, ownership of the, of the mortgage and then um, make the payments just like, you know, taking over the property that way. But technically we're gonna go over the next clause called an alienation clause. So what is an alienation clause? When the mortgager um, abandons the house, I'm guessing. No, nope, not when they abandon it. It's when the more the more the lender prevents uh, anyone who wants to buy the property from assuming the same loan that's already on the property, the existing loan, or or existing mm -hmm. rates. Kind of there. So think about it this way: right now, you own a house and you, um, it's worth 200,000 and you owe Wells Fargo 125 grand, right? You owe any bank 125 grand, right? So can you say, okay, I'm gonna sell this property today, you know, and then probably like two, three weeks, I'm gonna pay off Wells Fargo. Can you do that? No. No. Because the alienation clause says, hey, if you're going to convey the property, may basically sell it, give it, will it, whatever, whatever it might be, if it's going to go be conveyed from one party to another party, right, the alienation clause says the debt has to be paid off immediately. That's why the lawyers in Connecticut, the attorneys in Connecticut will take care of that. They will not transfer the deed until the money's taken care of. Because you can't say, oh, you know, yeah, 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 I know I owe that 125 grand, but um, I'm just gonna take this money. I know it's a Wells Fargo, but I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna head down to Mohegan, see if I can double it, and then I'll pay them off. 
right? That sounds like it'd be a pretty cool idea, right? But you can't do that. Alienation clause, and that's almost in all residential for sure that I know of. When the property is sold, the lender may either declare the entire debt due immediately or permit the buyer to assume the loan at an interest rate acceptable. Very rarely are loans um, assumable, but it's not impossible. It does happen sometimes. I've probably seen it only happen like once or twice in my life. All right. So that's something to be thinking about when we talk about. Um, so remember, we went over, and this is when it starts getting a little tricky. We went over acceleration clause. We went over defeasance clause. We went over alienation clause. So if you didn't, if you don't know the difference between all three of those, right now you're kind of like at a disadvantage, right? You need, you know that you need to go study right now if you don't know the difference between those three. Okay. Um, recording a mortgage or deed of trust. So it's basically said that um, recording gives constructive notice to the world. So what does that mean, giving constructive notice? So we talk about this in other units as well, and you need to know the difference, otherwise it gets tricky between actual notice. It's, and it's, the, it's when the public it's has, is, is made aware of that transaction. Um, yeah. That's right, because it's been recorded on basically a public document, a public record. So that's giving constructive notice. So you as a particular third party or a buyer or whatever it might be of a property, can say, well, you can't say, well, nobody ever told me and my attorney didn't tell me that and my seller, my agent didn't tell me that because it's recorded in the documents in the public record. So you do have constructive knowledge, right? Recording it will also establish the lien's priority, right? And also if it was another state where they have the Torin system, which you'll learn about this in another unit, it must be um, entered on a torn certificate, okay? So when we talk about priority, we're talking about what? When we say priority, what are we talking about? What does that really mean? Like, how does that work? Well, it's on the order they recorded, right? So more or less first come, first serve. Recorded, first, second, third, fourth, whatever it might be. If the property is sold or if something happens with the property, especially if it's sold and there's money to be given, the first mortgage is going to take what they owed first. If there's enough, then it will go to the second, then it will go to the third and so forth. Make sense? Yep. Once in a great while, you might see a lender require a subordination agreement. What's a subordination agreement? Anyone know? The first, first lender lowers their amount so that the second lender can get more? Well, it's not like they lower their amount. They, they will basically um, lower its position, its lien position. So you might go and get some type of loan where, okay, you're going to get a loan, but th these, this lender wants to be in the first position. And so then you have to go to the lender that's currently in the first position and make them in the second position. You ask them to sign a subordination agreement, which most of the time, most, most lenders are not going to want to do that, right? If you're first in line, it's going to be um, take quite a lot in order for you to get second in line, right? Okay. And so that's an agreement that would have to be signed. All right. So before we move on to types of loans, who's got questions? Anyone? All right, so let's talk about types of loans. So when we talk about these loans, the first and easiest one to understand is a straight loan, also known as a term loan or interest only loan, where the borrower makes periodic payments of interest only, followed by the payment of the principal in full at the, term of, at the end of the term. Okay, so this is interest only. So I'm going to tell you, as we go through many of these different types of mortgages, it's or loans, it's not like one is 
worse than the other, or, oh man, I would never go for that one, because each one has its own use, right? So like years, of, and it depends on your scenario, and it depends upon your comfort level. Years ago, when I worked at UPS, I knew these gentlemen and women that were making a lot of money, and they had to relocate. They were in management. Um, they had to relocate like every three years, right? And But they wanted to own a home. They wanted to um, be able to live in a nice single family, and they felt like the, the prices were going up, 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 right? So they, and they wanted to put as much money as possible in buying UPS stock because the UPS stock was private at the time. So they felt like, oh, I'm gonna invest as much as I can in my UPS stock. So with the house prices going up, 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 they would make only interest only payments. And then when they had to sell the house in three years, they would hope that the price went up and so that it's worth now the house is worth more than what they owe, right? But if the market was going down, because remember, they're not making payments, any principal payments. Mm -hmm. They were just making interest payments. Does that make sense? Yep. So if the market went down, they would find themselves underwater pretty quick, right? But again, in some scenarios, it could be, great. In other scenarios, you might be like, oh my gosh, that's way too risky for me. So it depends on your scenario. Okay. So that's a straight loan. Who's got questions on straight loans? Okay. The next one is an amortized loan. You know, basically what we're used to, which is a mortgage. And, you know, even now in today's world, they have mortgages that are like 10 years up to, I've even seen 40 years. Right. So, you know, you could be like 95 years old and get a 40 year mortgage. How cool would that be? <laughs> Terrible. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love to do that? Come on. No. Can the banks deny you? No, they can't. That's right. Remember that they can't. So maybe I'm going to try to do it just for the heck of it. Right. Um, but anyways, usually the way that this works is an amortized loan. Now, I am that person that I will sit and, and razz and rank on the banks and the this and the that and think that this is a total ripoff. But at the same time, if it wasn't for this type of loan, we wouldn't have such high ownership rates like we do. So when the banks came up with this amortized loan made system, maybe like 100 years ago, right, that's where more people were able to buy homes. But the way that they do it is really, um, to me, you know, they are taking advantage of us in a lot of ways. Because what happens is we pay the majority of our interest up front. So every day that goes by, you owe a certain amount of money. And even though your principal and interest payment might be the same for 30 years, every day, you're paying a little bit less interest and a little bit more principal and all the interest is front loaded. You see, that's why in the beginning of an amortized mortgage, the more payments you make, the more extra payments you make, you cut down on the number of those days. You cut down on the amount of balance that you're carrying with the house. Does that make sense? Who's got questions about that? Right. And we know that amortized means to kill off slowly. So here you're probably not going to be able to see it. Right. But here's like a little example, a little chart here. Right. You see the red is the interest and the blue is the principal. And you see this is the beginning of the mortgage. That's the end of the mortgage. And you see for the first like seven years or so, give or take, you're paying mostly interest. Right. And you're actually paying like here's an example on this house is a $255,000 house. Right. Over the life of the loan, you're paying $108,000 in interest. Isn't that something? Rob, don't they have loans set up where you can pay like half one part of the month and half the other part to knock off a bunch of interest? Yep. It's sometimes they're hard to find depending on the lender, 
but yes, we have those, they, they have those types of loans. Right. And that's, um, you know, something to think about. And we, we go even more over that in, um, unit 13, when we talk about the different loan programs that are out there and so forth, but yeah, they have those types of loans. Okay. Um, adjustable rate mortgages. So in today's world, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, it doesn't make sense to get that because our fixed rate mortgages are just so low, right? Um, you know, like I said, you can get a USDA loan or a CHAFA, like 3%, 3.25%. I've even heard people of getting 2.75%, right? So there's a lot, a lot of different ways um, that you can actually save money. But for adjustable, right, for adjustable, you're, you're going to have to um, really find a way to see if that makes sense to you. Because if the interest rates start going up, you're not going to really be able to make out. And so when, it, when we talk about adjustable, we're talking about a couple of different components. First of all, we have the index. So what is it, the index component of an ARM or adjustable rate mortgage? What is that? It adjusted, adjust the interest rate? Well, it's usually an economic indicator. Like, I don't know if everybody, anyone's ever heard of prime, the prime rate, right? Or LIBOR would be one of them. Like we used to actually go in the Wall Street Journal and see these different indexes. And they might be say, say okay, the um, loan is tied to this index. So if this index goes up, your interest rates will go up. If this index goes down, your interest rates will go down. Then there's also um, the index plus in many cases, plus a premium. So they might say, okay, your adjustable rate mortgage is prime plus one, right? And so that margin would be plus 1% interest, right? Then we also have rate caps. So what are rate caps all about? That's a limit on the interest rate okay. you know, that, that a lender can charge, right? Right. And so there's two different kinds of rate caps. And what are they? Right. Well, you have a periodic and life of the loan, a.k.a. aggregate, right? Yep. So for the periodic, they might say, okay, the most the interest rate can go up in a one-year period, let's say, is 2%. And then life of the loan, it might be 6%, right? And so, um, you know, that way with the payment cap, supposedly, it's supposed to be able to um, give you a little bit of safety net in case things were to happen where interest rates get too high, right? But again, what could possibly happen is maybe the amount of loan is actually increasing faster than the what the property is worth or how much money you're making, and then you find yourself in, in trouble. Make sense? Who's got questions on that? All right, what's a GEM? A growing equity mortgage. What is that? Like an accelerated um, payoff? or um yeah you paid off sooner like a speedy payoff right or they might say hey listen the payments are going to go up 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 you know they're going to go up for the first six months and then for the next six months and for the next five years and so forth because maybe you're just starting out as a doctor right and in the first couple of years you need much lower payments and then it could go up 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 and that's a growing equity mortgage or you can make payments faster um, in order to pay it off quicker, right? So there's a lot of different ways to look at a gem, okay? Balloon payment loan is the next type of loan. So when we talk about a balloon payment loan, what are we talking about? In theory, it's you have a certain set of payments that are one rate and then at the end or at some period during that payment, um, you have one super large payment. That's right. Now, the thing to remember about this type of loan is that you are making principal and interest payments. But 
it's partial. Okay, so that's why they want you to know it's a partially amortized loan. Does that make sense to you? Partially amortized. Does everybody get that? Yeah. So sometimes it can get a little bit tricky, but that's going to be like a trigger term to understand what um, the amount of the loan is and how it's working for you is that you still have some owed principal at the end of the term. Who's got questions on that? Anyone? All right. What's a reverse mortgage? You, it's it's almost like a, a loan or um, a loan against the equity in your home, and um, at the end of uh, it's based on the value of the equity you have in your home. That's a right. Loan that you use, and then when you're done, you don't own your home anymore. Okay. It's always advertised on TV with that guy. That yeah, guy. it's for old people. <laughs> <laughs> but just remember. Okay, I just turned, I'm turning 51, and I'm not a lot of years away from this anymore. Not like when I started the class and I was uh, 35, okay? Not for old people, I'm no. sorry. <laughs> so, I forgot his name, Alex Trebek. That's his name, Alex yeah. Trebek. Alex Trebek. So again, um, I'm not gonna say what's a good or bad loan. And I will tell you, I did some of these rever reverse mortgages to help people. Um, but remember, it's for people age 62 or older. Now, out of my experience, what's your guess? Who do you think would be most mad or unhappy or fighting about it or angry about a reverse mortgage? The children the of mortgage the mortgage kids. kids. The children. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the adult children. Like, the here we are. Okay, here, here's what I'm talking about that I've seen in real life. Here we are, we have an 80 year old woman, 80 something year old single woman, her husband passed away. She came to me to talk about a reverse mortgage. Why? Because number one, she had a house that was worth like $225,000. Paid off. Okay, but the only income she had was social security and in order for her to live what did she have to do she has to pay the taxes on the house the insurance on the house her prescriptions her food her old beat up car that they, she was mad that her children would hardly even let her drive anymore and she didn't want to move right so we had a long talk with her and like even a little counseling session. And she was so happy that we basically could give her like $2,000 a month for the rest of her life. It was like $1,800 or something for the rest of her life. And she was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so nice because now I can go see my family down in Georgia and, I have, and I'll have the money for it. And then I'll be able to keep my house. And you're saying I can live here the rest of my life and we can do this and we can do that. And she was happy. And then she like, calls me up a couple of days later. My son and daughter are so upset about me doing this. They want to come in. And I, I knew it was gonna, what was going to happen. So, you know, they came into the office. And what do you think they were all about? And they didn't want the house to leave the family, but they weren't helping the mom pay her bills. So, Oh, like, my gosh. Are you reading my mind? Yeah. <laughs> but can you believe that people are like that? They'd rather see their mother. They'd rather see their mother live alone, unhappy, no money, not enough for food and drug, um, her prescriptions and her taxes, right? Because they're worried about that their mother's going to leave them a $200,000 house. Crazy. Kind of disgusting. And that's what you see. Now, at the same time, it's not always perfect for everyone doing a, a reverse mortgage. The closing costs are a little bit more expensive because there's more paperwork involved. There's more, you know, there's actually people who are kind of like half um, 
actuary insurance type people and half mortgage people and they're running these different charts and figuring out you know how they're going to be able to basically make they'll make money off of the deal and yeah in many cases there there's no money or there's no house left over for the children but if this per woman was able to live the last 5 10 20 years who knows 25 years of her life and she doesn't have to leave her house and everything else doesn't it only make sense? These children, you know, her children can go and make their own money for themselves, just like this woman did with her husband. So that's my, this is a little bit of a ranting session class, isn't it, right? But it aggravates me when people are, um, you know, a little bit too greedy or not concerned with like even their own mother. Come on, wake it up a little bit. So that's, what? go ahead. I was going to ask, what would happen if she died a year after the mortgage? Well, then they're going to figure out how much money was actually paid out to her. And then they'll tell the, the um, depending on how much they paid out, you know, then they might basically what they were paid out, the children can either keep the house and pay the bank back or the children would have to sell the house. You know, of course, they'll still get a lot of that equity because it's only been a year or two, but the bank's got to get repaid. Put it that way. One way or another, the bank's got to get repaid. And it's not exorbitant. Is it a little bit of money? Of course, you know, but it's not, it's not exorbitant where they're totally, totally taking advantage of you. Yeah, but ultimately, one way or another, they usually have to get repaid. And usually the um, you know, the the siblings, they don't want to, usually they don't put up the money to keep the house they have to sell the house and then give the bank their share and then they can keep their share, whatever's left over for the equity. Make sense? Yep. All right. It's, it's pretty um, interesting thing. And I think it's a lot better than somebody having to be forced to go to um, some assisted living facility or nursing home if they really don't want to or don't have to. You know, but that's my opinion. All right, foreclosure. So like we already talked about, um, there's no exact time period as when a lender will start at foreclosure proceedings. Okay. It depends on that particular lender and when that person went into default and all that good stuff. And um, basically, um, they're, going to, um, they're going to take possession of the property of that lender. Usually it's gonna be a bank. And then it becomes what they call an REO property or real estate owned property. It goes into their REO portfolio. Okay. And um, usually there's, well, there's basically, they tell you in your yellow book, there's three general types of foreclosure proceedings, judicial, non-judicial, and strict foreclosure, right? So depending on the state and the situation, that's how they're going to do it. And so we know that the default for Connecticut is strict foreclosure. But let's talk about these other ones first. The first one is called judicial foreclosure. Allows the property to be sold by court order after the mortgagee has given sufficient notice. When a borrower defaults, the lender can accelerate the due date and remain principal. They then file a suit to foreclose the property or the lien after the presentation of the facts in court, if the court grants the request, the property is ordered sold. And a public sale is advertised and held. So let me ask you this, who knows when is a property um, sold on auction? Has anyone ever seen a foreclosed property to be sold on auction? I have. Okay. When is a property given to a real estate agent um, or put on the market to sell? So one is by the bank and one's by the town or state, perhaps. Is that always the case or you're kind of guesstimating? I, I don't know. The ones I've seen, I've, I don't know. I'm kind of blending, yeah. Okay. Anybody really know? Does anybody know for sure? Like, how is it decided? when a property should go under foreclosure versus a property is going to be um, 
given to a uh, real estate agent. Do, 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 do. Is it debt to answer or debt to how much it's worth or oh. how much on it? All right. So here's the story. Believe it or not, there are properties that get foreclosed on even if they have equity in the property. You might be saying to yourself, okay, so wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's say the property is worth 200,000, but they only owe 100,000. Why is it being foreclosed on? They've defaulted on their payment to something or someone. Maybe they're just not making their payments for one reason or another. You know, they're supposed to be paying $1,500 a month and they're not making that payment. And you might be like, well, why can't they just refinance? Well, is the bank going to let you refinance a loan if you can't prove that you have income? No, right? So there's some people, if they have equity in their property, then, and the court can pretty much determine that it's a pretty decent amount, then most of the time, and there's always exceptions to the rule and so forth, but most of the time, if you have equity, the judge is going to order it to be sold on an auction. If you don't have equity, most of the time, they're going to give it to the lender, who's then going to um, give it to their asset management company, who is then going to usually hire a real estate agent to put it on the market. So does that make sense to everyone? Yes. All right. So now we have the second type, non-judicial foreclosure. Some states allow non-judicial foreclosure procedures to be used when the security instrument contains a power of sale clause, no court action is required. In those states that recognize deed of trust loans, the beneficiary is given the power of sale, which is conducted by the trustee, right? Um, the trustee or mortgagee will send a notice of default to the bar indicating that the amount must be paid to repay the debt. Um, as well as the action that will be taken if the required payment is not made. If the borrower fails to cure the default within a certain time, they're gonna send a notice of default to the borrower or foreclosure indicating where and when the property will be sold at public auction. So you see that one is a little bit less, there's no court action there, right? And then we have the wonderful world of strict foreclosure. That's usually Connecticut, right? Where basically they're saying, First, appropriate notice must be given to the delinquent borrower. Once the proper documents have been prepared and recorded, the court establishes a deadline for the balance of the defaulted debt to be paid in full. If the borrower does not pay off the loan by that date, the court simply awards full legal um, title to the lender. And so I've seen that actually happen in real life, right? Um, just give me one moment. So basically, when we're talking about strict foreclosure, I mean, like I said, I've seen that happen in real life where what happens? Um, I had this house for sale. This was a few years back um, in Ashford for sale. And we were, it was a beautiful 400 and something thousand dollar house. And we were trying everything we could do in order to sell this property. But the, the market just wasn't demanding what we needed to get for it. And we even tried other things like a short sale and so forth, just couldn't make it happen one issue after the next, right? And um, so they were served a Liz Pendens um, saying that the foreclosure was getting started. And then over a period of about a month and a half, two months, they received, they had to go to court this time and then the next time and then this document wasn't done and then they had to go to court again. So basically after like four or five times when they finally went to court and did counseling and tried to make it all work out, finally um, the bank had everything in place and the judge said, hey, um, I'm sorry, but I'm awarding this property to Chase Bank and slammed down the gavel. And then the seller, um, he called me up. He was still at the court and he's like, hey, Rob, you know, I'm so sorry to say, but they, they, they awarded it to the bank. And I felt so bad for them. And, they, and the judge gave them 30 days to move out, right? But one of the things that I thought was so interesting was that within like an hour and a half, I get a phone call from another agent saying, hey, Rob, 
you know, um, I just wanted to know when you could think, you know, and he was nice to me. He was cool. I, I know him for a few years. Hey, when do you think you can get your sign down? Because I just got the order from our lender to um, put it back on the market. You know, because the bank didn't want to hold it. The bank wanted to sell it as soon as possible. And um, so that's the whole point when we talk about um, strict, for, uh, strict foreclosure. So who's got questions about strict foreclosure? Hey, Rob, I'm curious. Um, like some states are more like landlord friendly or land, uh, or tenant friendly or um, they're, they're, I'm assuming California, when it comes to floor closure, really plays the hand to the, the homeowner, correct? Like strict foreclosure is, is that? Connecticut. I know that's Connecticut, but um, I mean, of those three, which ones like are is strict foreclosure like the, the the most beneficial to like the uh, the homeowner is versus like a judicial foreclosure like I know some states are like easier and softer on um, on foreclosure laws you know or landlord laws they seem to go hand in hand landlord and you get what I'm saying like landlord friendly states right. and then like borrower the North state, like, in Connecticut is definitely more tenant pro tenant and. I mean, I think in many cases, they're kind of like, they kind of favor the owner a little bit more than the lender, even with strict foreclosure, because they have to have all, the lender really does have to have all their documents in place and be able to submit everything to the court. And I've seen it happen where they have to go back to the court like four or five times because they're missing a signature or the judge says, well, I wanna see a copy or the original document for this. And remember, if this loan 20 something years ago was sold to this third party, to that third party, to the next third party, in many cases, some of these lenders, they have a hard time getting um, a hold of all these past documents. And that's why for the most part, um, lenders, they don't even want to have to go through a foreclosure because on average, it costs them twenty to $25,000 to actually do a foreclosure. Because by the time they pay attorney's fees and court costs and all types of um, extra things that they have to pay for, it actually costs them a lot of money. So, you know, in some ways you might say, oh, well, judicial foreclosure is easier on the buyer or non-judicial or strict, but it just depends on the circumstances, I think, for the most part. I mean, I don't like the idea of non-judicial because like you don't even get the satisfaction of going in front of a judge, right? And so that's, you know, that's why I don't like that idea. But um, strict foreclosure, like I said, um, they give you right up until the date of, in Connecticut anyways, right in, up until that final court date in order to make that payment. So if you can come up with that money, you can usually stop the foreclosure and be able to uh, keep your house. But isn't it, so with the strict foreclosure, is that whole full payment due clause there? Yeah, so if you had the full payment, you could just go buy a new house, right? Well, we're not talking about the full payment, we're talking about the full payment of what's in arrears. So okay. if you owe them, you know, eight, 10, 12, $15,000. Okay. Yep, yep not the full payment of the total, you know, loan amount necessarily. Right. Is like a Connecticut, a real pain in the butt state, like regarding these, like, I always hit like, I don't know, when I think of these things and I think of Connecticut, I always, I always think, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't know, like it seems like other states around the country have just better yeah. processes, but I, maybe it's relatively speaking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. All right. So the next term that we have, is deed in lieu of foreclosure. So what's that all about? That is when the, the buyer surrenders the property, so to speak, and if they had any equity, they lose it. And it also saves the bank fees, but if they had like second mortgages or anything like that, et cetera, those are not probably getting paid. Right. Right. So and it gets really tricky. I mean, it takes, a, you know, we help people like, for instance, do short sales and deed in lieu of foreclosures are even better than a regular foreclosure. You know, so it can't give you exact numbers because there really isn't. But if you think about it, the way that it works 
is on your credit report, each, each particular type of scenario has is supposed to have a different code and will affect your credit differently. So short sale might affect your credit score like 50 to 100 and 125 points. Foreclosure might be 100, 150 points. Friendly foreclosure, otherwise known as a deed in lieu of foreclosure, might be like 50 to 100 points because you are showing the bank that you care about, you're not able to pay, and you want to try to work things out, right? I've had a couple of people do a deed in lieu of foreclosure because they just didn't want to deal with trying to sell the property and the bank agreed to it. And I've seen people do it, whether it's a short sale or a deed in lieu of foreclosure, where um, in two years, 24 months, they're getting another mortgage and buying another house. Whereas with a foreclosure, it shows that you're uncooperative and it could take you, depending on the scenario, a lot longer to buy a house. It's just like, and again, I'm not trying to pass judgment on anyone. Don't get mad at me. But the truth of the matter is, if you declare bankruptcy, it stays on your credit report a lot longer. And it's you know, again, it will be much harder to get a mortgage. Whereas, you know, if you're showing some cooperation, try to work things out and make the payments that you can, a lot of times the, you're going to be able to be better off in the long run. Okay. And um, just to give you an example, like one that I had probably like, it was like maybe eight, nine years ago, this gentleman, his wife had cancer and he had to bring her up to Boston all the time. So he asked me to put the house on the market. We were trying, trying, trying to sell it. The market was slow. We really couldn't get much headway. We weren't getting very many offers. And um, he called me up one day. He's like, Rob, he's like, it's too much for me to keep up with these bills. Winter's coming. I'm going to have to keep the house heated. I don't have the money. He's like, so I hope you're not going to be mad at me. He's like, but I'm just going to give the house to the bank. You know, it's basically called cash for keys. Um, He's like, what do you think? And I'm like, you know, Charlie, just do it. You know, I mean, you got to put your attention towards your wife. You know, you're going up to Boston all the time. And I said, I'll even call the bank for you if you want me to and see what I could do. He's like, no, 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 I'll do it. But I just wanted to, you know, he told me, he's like, I just wanted to run it by you, see what you thought. And, you know, he goes, I was hoping that you wouldn't feel, you know, that you did all this work for nothing. I said, listen, that's not my priority is to make sure you're all set. So he called up the bank and gave them the story of what's going on. And the bank honestly told them, which is pretty incredible. They said, okay, you let us know, please keep, please get the house broom clean, right? Which basically get all your personal belongings out. Let us know when that is done. Leave the keys in the, uh, in one of the drawers in the kitchen, leave the back door unlocked and give us a call. And we will um, have somebody come over there and pick up the keys. And we'll fax you over this document, which he faxed it to my office. He came to my office, he signed it, we faxed it back to the bank, and that was it. And he was done with the whole scenario. So sometimes, you know, when you have emergencies in your life, it might be the best thing to do. You know, so there's a lot involved with that. Um, and that's, I think, uh, where we're going to stop here when we talk about real estate financing. And, Rob, um, so he got nothing in return for that? Yeah, but he didn't have um, hardly any equity because the market was so low. I mean, he probably had like, um, he was probably going to be one way or the other. Like it was a couple thousand dollars one way or the other and he just couldn't do it anymore. I think they might have given him a thousand dollars to actually just move out. But even in today's world, I can tell you that, um, so eight, nine, seven, eight, nine years ago, when people were doing deed in lieu and foreclosure, or they were doing short sales, I used to see some banks give a thousand, fifteen hundred. The most I ever saw was twenty five hundred in order to move and leave the place in good condition. The last like three, four years, I haven't seen the banks give anything. And people try once in a great while, you know, you, you can get it. But most of the time, they're not giving any money now. Yeah. So um, that's where we're kind of going to leave off for this particular class, you know, real estate financing. And then we're going to pick up um, on the next session, which will be on Thursday.